We now return to National Geographic's Strange Days on Planet Earth. If you don't suspect any problem in such a beautiful environment, if it affects any animal, it can affect us. We're facing a situation that may be an emergency. Something is wrong in that water. Something's happening in that water. How much time do we have? I think we really have to speed up the rate at which we're conducting these investigations. It's like something out of science fiction. Unsettling transformations are sweeping across the planet. And clue by clue, investigators are assembling a new picture of Earth. They suspect we've entered a time of faster global change than any human being has ever witnessed. Where are we headed? What can we do to alter the course? In this confusing era, only one thing is certain. These are strange days on planet Earth. Sometimes clues come from the strangest sources. Animals may be trying to tell us something. 21st century signals from ancient creatures, and it's happening all around the planet. Researchers are scrutinizing a handful of alarming signs. A frog with scrambled organs, a ravenous horde of starfish, a species of whale with an aberrant rate of illness. On its own, each of these events is disturbing. But what if the problems aren't isolated? What if changes that appear unconnected are all actually linked beneath the surface? Considered together, this growing chorus of animals might be trying to tell us something bigger, something about the health of our planet. To decode the message, researchers from a gamut of specialties are combining forces to define new areas of science. And our investigation of this pioneering work begins with a simple observation. All the animals examined in this episode live in the water. So that's our first clue. Follow the water. God, if we had a helicopter here, I bet there's little pools in between all of these hills. Oh, what's this? All right, let's go check it out. Looks like it could be good. It's an out of the way place, but biologist Tyrone Hayes believes this marsh may contain clues about dangers that many of us could be facing. Hayes is searching for one particular creature he thinks will tell him about the health of the water. And he's just one member of a research army. Investigators around the world are uncovering signs of trouble in rivers and in water all the way down to the sea. Some of the more disturbing problems can't be seen directly. Okay, continue in. But evidence is turning up practically everywhere. Right in front of us, John. We've spent the last decades trying to clean up rivers and control what pours off our shores. In many places, water appears cleaner than it has in generations. Have we been fooling ourselves? A good place to pick up the trail of water is in the middle of continents, in marshes and ponds. So right along here. It's here that Tyrone Hayes is on a frog hunt. He's looking for the northern leopard frog, an animal whose numbers are plummeting in some places. 
I saw one. Here, right here. Put your put your net on the other side of where I am. Okay. As a scientist and as a citizen, I care about the frog in part because the frog tells me something about the environment. I realize it might be difficult to get everybody to care, to get people to understand that the frog is telling you something about you. The leopard frog is not the only such animal in trouble. At least 20 frog species have vanished worldwide. And many surviving populations are crashing. Today's decline is puzzling. Frogs have flourished for about 200 million years. But now some of these escape artists may be meeting their match. At first glance, the leopard frogs look healthy. But Hayes has discovered anomalies inside their reproductive organs. Some male leopard frogs have eggs growing inside their testes. They are hermaphrodites. The frog spends all of his important and critical developmental stages in water and then it transforms into this organism that crawls out into the air. Stop, stop, and let it stop. Okay, I think it's under here. But yeah. it's basically an aquatic organism. We can always let it go, in case we miscount it. Come here. The water haze believes is where he must look to find out what is causing the deformities. On this quest, Hayes is following a surprising lead. U.S. farms produce about one trillion ears of corn every year. This bounty means more food for more people, but it can't be achieved without man-made chemicals. We know such substances often have unintended consequences, but the details can still surprise us. Hayes suspects that one of the most popular weed killers used on cornfields, atrazine, may be what's harming his frogs. Atrazine, which is usually sprayed before planting, doesn't stay inside corn, but rain and wind can spread this chemical into frog territory. Ah, okay, maybe you don't have to go that fast. You guys, you guys big whips. Where does the road go from here? Oh. Fork in the road, should we take it? Ah! Hayes first came to the case when he was hired on an animal safety study for Atrazine's manufacturer. There ain't no water. Hayes parted ways with that project, and now he continues his research with other funding. Did we see any frogs? This means frogs. summer's on the road, on the because side? leopard frogs are spread over much of the northern half of the continent. If we could get something right here where the corn starts, that would be really key. What we're trying to do is big, in the sense that, you know, some people might pull out a plot and say, this is my field site. Or maybe some people will pull out, you know, a couple of square acres and say, this is my field site. I think these would probably be... I pull out a map of the U.S. and say, this is my field site. Let's go there. So we take nine all the way up to six. Here, wait, let me write it down. And your palm pilot? Yep. Hayes has been uncovering a pattern. The deformed frogs he's collecting come from waters containing atrazine. Frogs from clean water tend to be healthy. <laughs> no. Wait, 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 wait. Is atrazine really the cause of the problems? To answer this question, Hayes has been running experiments. He raises two groups of just hatched frogs in his laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley. The groups are the same, except one has atrazine in its water. Snout bit 35. 
Mayo. Mayo. The answers come when Hayes and his students dissect the frogs Going in. and prepare cross sections of the reproductive organs. Hayes sees a clear result. Most of the frogs raised in pure water are healthy, but many of the male frogs raised in atrazine are hermaphrodites. I was blown away. I went through everything again. And these hermaphrodites, in every case, were always atrazine treated. Hayes's work on developing frogs is confirming that atrazine can cause the male hormone testosterone to turn into the female hormone estrogen. This extra estrogen can cause males to grow eggs and even develop ovaries. Hayes fears that these abnormalities may pose a threat to the future of this species. Finding a new potential factor in the decline of leopard frogs is a breakthrough. But the more important discovery may be about chemical dosages in general. With atrazine, though, we're talking about effects at 0.1 micrograms per liter. That's the weight of one one thousandth of a grain of salt that causes this hermaphroditism. It's unbelievable, the doses that we're looking at, 0.1 part per billion. The frog sensitivity was remarkable, but Hayes went on to discover a bizarre twist. While tiny doses caused deformities, larger doses were less harmful. Big amounts may trigger the body's defenses, while small doses can sneak in under the radar. Hayes's results raise doubts about chemical safety laws and regulations, which often assume that a bigger dose is always worse. It's no surprise, then, that Hayes triggered debate when he presented his work to a federal panel. First of all, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity for our team to address the panel today. And, uh, Atrazine's manufacturer strongly disputed Hayes' findings. Their scientists came up with different results using different methods. At this point in time, a risk assessment is not feasible or possible. The Environmental Protection Agency found Hayes' work inconclusive, and recommended further study. But meanwhile, a growing body of independent scientific evidence is supporting Hayes's conclusions that atrazine can harm animals. And Hayes is finding additional allies. We have some college students here, and they're, they're doing water samples throughout the area. And they were asking me if it would be all right to go up there and just take some water samples. You get them cowboys mad. <laughs> okay, thank you. What's the verdict? You're all, you're okay. Thank, thank you very you much, Bob. Okay. You have a wonderful day. Great. People in farm communities are starting to offer help. You got everybody's blessing, I think. So <laughs> nobody's gonna bother you out here. So. Oh, thanks for all your right. time. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the ride. Right. So if we can tell you that something that you're spraying on your crop runs off into the water and causes your frogs to develop abnormally and I think that's not just a concern for the animals that are in that pond but also for you know the people that are living in that environment that water is the same water that we're drinking you can't live without water and you can't grow food without water and if what you're putting in the food is ruining the water then I think we got to think a little bit about that cycle there's one right there. Oh, there's another. Okay. We're here. Let's do this. Hayes is finding problems in America's marshes. But consider this. Water doesn't stay put. From marshes, water works its way down into rivers, collecting synthetic chemicals from an ever-increasing area of land. No one's exactly sure what's in the water now. We've formulated over 75,000 compounds and put them into useful products, 
medicines, pesticides, household goods. But with so many substances in the water, the possible combinations are endless. The question then is what happens when living things take in not just one chemical, but many? The scary thing is that we've just started asking that question. One man's quest to discover the consequences of chemical cocktails begins here. This river looks pristine, a wilderness far from the nearest city. But biologist Robert Michaud is learning that remoteness is no guarantee of purity. The St. Lawrence carry essentially all the mistakes we've done over the last decades all the contaminant we have been dumping and we are still dumping from the large city along the St. Lawrence are carried down this water. Rural areas also feed the St. Lawrence. Synthetic chemicals in the region's marshes end up here. Michaud has spent two decades trying to understand the impact of chemicals on some of the river's most mysterious creatures. Hidden in this black water is a small population of white whales. Wow. Belugas. The whales are known as the canaries of the sea because of their songs. Michaud and his colleagues believe that each pod has its own dialect, its own melodies. In the Arctic, a legend tells of the time when we understood the whale's songs. We could speak to them, and they could speak to us. But over time, this knowledge was lost. Michaud is now trying to reopen the dialogue. The story of tracking whales is essentially a story of being patient, to gather all these little bits and pieces of information that you need to put together to have somehow an image of their life. Hey, Bella. She's a hot mama. All information that we've collected suggests that these animals are in trouble. Belugas here have one of the highest cancer rates of any wild animal studied. To gather clues about their health, Michaud and colleagues use a dart gun to collect tissue samples. Yes, it's good. Yes. Dozens of chemicals have been discovered in the bodies of the St. Lawrence belugas. Some dead belugas are so full of toxins that they technically qualify as hazardous waste. We know they are exposed to an extraordinary mixture of contaminant, but we still don't know what are the exact impact of contaminant on these animals. Michaud's hunch is that chemical mixtures may be causing the cancers. But investigating the effects of chemical combinations takes a special set of skills. And well-trained, healthy belugas. She's such a good whale. Yes, she is a very good whale. 
Pathologist Sylvain de Guise's research has the potential to change how we decide what's safe, not just for whales, but for people as well. Nice job, Naku. And that's it. Now we're heading to the lab. We're doing something that is very non-traditional. We're shaking the boundaries of what people are comfortable with. For the last 30 years, we've been looking at chemicals individually, decide if they're toxic or not, and then assume that that's the answer. Now, what we're doing is we're looking at, at chemicals when you mix them together, and we found really, really interesting things. De Geese tests the beluga's sensitivity to chemical cocktails by looking at the response of their immune cells, cells that fight infections and help fend off cancer. He doses these cells with combinations of chemicals often found in belugas. De Geese now adds bacteria to the chemically treated cells. Immune cells that are healthy will multiply and engulf the bacteria. But if the immune cells have been harmed by chemicals, their reproduction will drop dramatically. We found that if two chemicals individually are not toxic, when you mix them, they may become toxic. They may not be safe anymore. We're kind of shaking what we've accepted for 30 years. Traditionally, chemical effects have been studied one by one. But de Geese is convinced that this approach has caused us to overlook dangerous mixtures. To make matters worse, thousands of synthetic chemicals in the world mean a staggering number of combinations. De Geese and his colleagues have found that in a whale's body, the consequence of one of these pairs may be an increased risk of intestinal cancer. De Geese's discoveries call into question how we assess chemical safety. He believes that studying combinations is now the task. If so, we more or less have to start from scratch. If we decided to test 80,000 chemicals and then all the possible combinations of those, that would be practically impossible. It's very stressful to discover problems that are bigger than your answers. Then again, I'd rather raise questions and be comfortable in silence. The barriers that separate us from wildlife are thinner than many of us believe. The water that animals rely on is part of a single interconnected system, the same network that provides our drinking water. What are chemical cocktails doing to us? Do our homes protect us from chemical dangers? What's getting inside and through which pathways? Epidemiologist Shauna Swan has spent most of her career investigating the effects of chemicals found in tap water. Unraveling the effects of the myriad of chemicals to which we're exposed every day is an extremely difficult task. But I think that our default assumption, the thing we should assume until it's disproven, is that if it affects any animal, it will affect us. That's what my baseline assumption is. We're not exempt. We're not privileged. Swan and her team have already found evidence of our vulnerability. They discovered high miscarriage rates in women who drank tap water with elevated levels of chlorine byproducts. The result of that study was that the regulatory agencies lowered the permissible levels of those chlorination byproducts. Swan is now turning her attention to the reproductive health of men. In one groundbreaking study, 
Swan compared men's semen from fertility clinics in four cities, New York, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, and Columbia, Missouri. By counting the number of active sperm, Swan and her team found one place stood out. It wasn't the result she was expecting. Up front, I would have guessed that semen quality in New York and Minneapolis and Los Angeles would be poorer than the great rural <laughs> Midwest, uh, where things seem cleaner. So we were very, very surprised with our results. What we found was that semen quality among men in Missouri was extremely low. So the next step in this detective story was to ask why. So I looked for factors that might explain the difference between a big city and this rural center that we were located in. Does this region have heavy industry? Swan found it had less than the other places in her study. Was it air pollution? The area had the least smog of all her sites. She was looking for something the region had in abundance that the others in her study didn't. It was all around her. Farm chemicals. If these chemicals were the cause, Swan should be able to see a sperm quality difference between men with different exposures. So Swan ran a second study. All of the men seemed fit, but in one group, those who had been exposed to a combination of farm chemicals had a higher risk of having unhealthy sperm. Higher than could be explained by adding up the individual risks of each chemical on its own. Although controversial, Swan's findings add to a growing body of evidence linking chemical cocktails with men's reproductive health. For Swan, the next mystery was how these men were exposed. We can inhale chemicals, ingest them, or absorb them through our skin. But most of the men didn't work with chemicals directly. So what was going on? Swan realized that all the men shared one thing, tap water. Furthermore, Swan knew that many water treatment plants were not designed to remove farm chemicals. So it was possible that men in Missouri were getting these toxins right in their own kitchens. A cornucopia of chemicals enters our homes, and not only through tap water, Hundreds, if not thousands, of man-made chemicals are found in the food we eat. In our carpets, fabrics, and detergents. In our cosmetics. Through our plumbing, these compounds flow out into the world. And that's where they can affect lives beyond our own. We just have to increase our awareness that everything we do matters and be a little more mindful about what we're introducing into our environments, into our houses, and into our bodies. Swan knows that some chemicals are held in the body for a lifetime, but many others are eliminated naturally once we stop taking them in. So reducing the number and amounts of toxins we encounter could help us. But until the testing and filtering of tap water for chemicals becomes widespread, how can we reduce the toxic burden of the next generation? Swan and researchers like her believe the best approach may be to keep the chemicals from entering the water in the first place. Given what they've shown us about the dangers in the water, 
Many researchers suspect that plants and animals may offer solutions as well. Some living things have remarkable powers to counteract synthetic chemicals. Can we use these natural allies to help us remove poisons from the soil before they are flushed into creeks and streams? For one scientist, the quest to remove toxins from the environment is linked to a family tradition. There's one waiting for me right there. I can just... Oh, Daddy, you're right. Little sunfish. He's going to go get his daddy over here. <laughs> Crabs, Eddie. We do. We have more clams, I guess. <laughs> Yay, let's catch a clam. <laughs> How would it bite us? Geneticist Richard Meager has fished this lake for 20 years. But now he and his daughter must return their catch to the lake. That's because some of the fish are contaminated with a toxic form of mercury. I feel very exasperated to find out that this lake has mercury-contaminated fish. Probably 90% of the fish in that lake are safe to eat, but you don't know which ones you're getting when you pull them out of the lake. Mercury from industry seeps into the lake. At the bottom of the food chain, Bacteria can transform this mercury into a highly toxic form called methylmercury. As tiny organisms feed, they take in the methylmercury of their prey. The next predator gets a more concentrated serving, and so on up the food chain. The mercury concentration in top predators can be over 10 million times greater than in the water. Good one, good one. Bring it in slow. Get, get the net, Just swing it up here and I'll get it. Okay, swing it over to me. Yeah. Okay. Meager believes he can cut off the chain at the bottom. He wants to harness nature itself to prevent methylmercury from getting into our water. Meager is a pioneer in a new scientific field that uses plants to clean up environmental messes. When I first thought about it, I was just hoping to clean up certain particular kinds of pollutants. And the plants had all the capabilities that I needed uh, to extract things from the soil. Plants really evolve to extract nutrients from the soil. And we're going to use all that machinery, that incredible 100 million miles of roots per acre that a plant can generate to extract toxins like mercury from the soil. Some plants have a natural ability for handling toxins. Ferns can survive in arsenic-laced soil alpine herbs in zinc, mustard plants in lead, clovers in motor oil. But Meager knew of no plants that can withstand large amounts of methylmercury. Could he bestow this talent on plants? Adding bacterial genes to plants was a simple idea, but its execution and persuading the skeptics took years. And I thought someone was going to come along and say, there's amazing science going on in here. Here's some money. That just didn't happen. We had terrible time. I, I had people say, oh, you're a charlatan. Plants can't do things like that. But Meager persevered. After two decades of trial and error, he succeeded in getting mercury-eating genes into plants. One of his plants stores mercury in its leaves. Another emits it in less harmful form as vapor. If Meager's technology is adopted, large amounts of a toxin will never have the chance to enter the water.
Mercury is only Meager's first target. Other poisons are already in his sights, as are the bacterial genes that will become part of his next arsenal. So for me, we just started. I've got hundreds of genes in mind. We've got maybe 20 we've worked on already. We're having a very high success rate. I think you're seeing the birth of a new field. There's no reason that the environment can't be 10 times cleaner. Meager hopes to play a part in getting us to a day when people can enjoy this lake as much as he did with his father. I don't think without the help of a lot of very high-tech solutions, we're gonna do it. I think we're gonna survive by using every trick we've got. Thanks to new technologies, we can now start cleaning up invisible toxins in our water, and maybe just in time because more is at stake than we imagined. Much of this water ends up in coastal zones, and here chemicals may have the power to set off a cascade of events that will threaten not just individual species, but entire ecosystems. Can we use what we're learning to protect our coasts? And if so, where do we begin? Not far from the shore, farmer Vince Vitale grows sugarcane. Vitale is one of many farmers around the world who are becoming increasingly aware of what flows from their fields. I've lived here all my life at Ripple Creek, where my grandfather and my father had farmed before me. I grow sugarcane like just every other farm in this district does. To grow cane, farmers like Vitale must use herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, and nitrogen fertilizer. Many of these synthetic chemicals end up in rivers. Joining this runoff is manure from herds of cattle. I think farmers have never had the intention of, of causing problems to the environment. But unfortunately, no, we didn't know any better. But we are now coming to, to realise that there is a problem. Vitale knows that once runoff from his farm, and thousands like it, enters the river, it's a short run to the sea. Only a few miles from Vitale's farm is the Great Barrier Reef. world's largest expanse of tropical coral, a vast living structure stretching for more than 1,200 miles off Australia's coast. Recently, ominous changes have been taking place here. Marine biologist Caterina Fabricius is wondering if farms like Vince Vitale's are linked to what some consider one of the reef's gravest threats. Could chemical runoff be triggering repeated and massive outbreaks of a destructive starfish called the crown of thorns. Crown of thorns are fairly rare in normal conditions on the reef, so I can spend hundreds of dives not seeing a single one and get fairly excited when I see a single one. But once you see an outbreak and there are just literally hundreds crawling over each other, the whole emotional situation changes. It's pretty disconcerting and, and not a pretty sight, no. As outbreaks go, this one may appear sluggish. But speed up time, and the crown of thorns true destructive power is revealed.
For the third time since the 1960s, scientists have noted that the reef is under siege. Fabricius wants to solve the puzzle before the next outbreak starts. The Chronothon's issue has been unresolved for 40 years, and scientists have their pet explanations of why outbreaks are formed. Fabricius has zeroed in on a single chemical from farms like Vince Vitale's as a major culprit. This chemical is nitrogen, found in artificial fertilizer and manure. Tropical storms flush it from fields into creeks and rivers. On the reef, nitrogen acts as fertilizer. It can help spark the growth of algae that are just the right size to be eaten by crown of thorn larvae. In this way, Fabricius believes, more starfish larvae can survive to adulthood. The nitrogen theory is controversial. No one has yet made a convincing argument that crown of thorns outbreaks are linked to nitrogen. Fabricius and her team take on the case. They want to know where the nitrogen ends up. It's going to be here for the whole day and probably most of tomorrow as well. And then it's no easy task. More than two dozen rivers, including Vince Vitale's, flow into a long stretch of coastal waters swirling with complex currents. All the river discharge data are available. So we should be able to go back and, and download those data. But with her colleagues, Fabricius calculates places on the reef that would have had high nitrogen levels after a big storm. Which means if the larvae are still in the water column, they really have a lot of food available. Did the most recent Crown of Thorns outbreak start where nitrogen was most concentrated? Fabricius and her collaborators must search enormous swaths of reef. Eventually, they discover that the starfish distribution corresponds to outbreaks that began years earlier at the nitrogen hotspots. This finding, along with other work by Fabricius, has given the nitrogen theory perhaps its most credible foundation. I think there's enough information to conclude that terrestrial runoff is affecting the Great Barrier Reef that there's a very clear link between the management of the land and the management of the coastal resources. We are beginning to understand the delicate interplay of chemicals and their power to alter living systems. Nitrogen fertilizer is one of the great triumphs in the history of food production. But only recently have we started tracking its unintended consequences. Given our growing awareness of the reef's extreme sensitivity to nitrogen, can we reduce the flow? Vince Vitale is ready to take action. Quando il culo tocca l'acqua, ti impari a nadare, which means when the water starts to touch your backside, you learn to swim. And I think that we're all starting to learn to swim now because the water is touching our backside. Things are, are disappearing that we didn't think would disappear. Things are changing and we don't like the changes. And we need to get up and start swimming. Vitale hopes to find a solution by looking back to a day when less runoff came from the fields. This is what much of Queensland looked like when his grandparents began farming here in 1880. Trees and marshes then served as a natural barrier that kept runoff from flowing into the river. 
today on Vitale's land and around most fields in this area, farmers and ranchers have cleared trees right up to the riverbanks. Only a thin band of trees remains, not nearly wide enough to sop up farm chemicals before they reach the water. Sometimes the most complex problems have the simplest of solutions. Vitale has decided to replace some of his cane with new trees. If more farmers follow Vitale's lead, they could help safeguard the health of the reef. I could have probably made myself an extra, maybe $1,000, $1,500 on, on a year if, if I had a good crop here that's two and a half acres. But I'm prepared to let that go. And to me, it's just a little shot in the arm for, for um, the effort I put in there to go down there, walk among my trees and say, I've created this, I love this. And it's, hey, it makes me feel good. And feeling good is a good thing. A person might live longer that way. Farmers like Vitale are starting to make progress keeping chemicals out of rivers. And such efforts are all the more important given recent discoveries of problems far beyond coastal waters. According to one school of thought, toxins are diluted to safe levels by the time they reach the open ocean. But are the creatures that live here really protected from chemicals? In the past decades, researchers have become aware that sharks, bluefin tuna, swordfish, and killer whales all have toxins in their tissues. Where are they being exposed? To find out, marine biologist Tierney Teese is trying to discover where open ocean animals spend their time. Teese is part of the largest oceanographic project in history, the Census of Marine Life. Tag team, tag team, the sunspot, how do you copy? Okay, sunspot, we're going eight miles out, heading 270. Here's our GPS coordinates, we're at 30. The census aims to chart nothing less than which creatures live where, what they're doing, and most critically, where they may be encountering dangerous chemicals. The animal Tease is studying for the census is the mola mola. This slow, gentle fish is found in every tropical and temperate ocean. It can grow to 5,000 pounds on a diet mainly of jellyfish. For over a decade, Tease has been observing Mola from the water. But she's about to adopt more sophisticated surveillance. What's so exciting is that now with this huge collaboration, we're coming up with the technology to allow us entry into this, into this enormous living space. Tease is using new tracking devices that will record a fish's travel diary for up to one year. Tag team, tag team, sunspot. spot. I've got a fish over here that you're uh, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and it's 10 boats. 12 o'clock, 10 boats. Uh, 12 o'clock, about 100 yards. Okay. No one yet knows precisely which toxins are in Mola Mola. These animals have long been thought to spend most of their lives far from the coast, far from the sources of runoff. It's five boats. Okay, that's good. You're turning good but the tags could reveal the true pathways of this fish. Okay, I still don't see it. 12 o'clock, two and a half boats. Right in front of us, John. And you're right on top of the fish. Oh, I see it, I see it right there. It's at the surface. Okay. Straight ahead, straight ahead, straight ahead. And stop. What these tags allow us to do is essentially travel with these animals 
into the places that are most important to them, into the places that are vital to their livelihood. Census researchers are charting the travel habits of animals once widely believed to live primarily in the open ocean. Mola mola, northern bluefin tuna, salmon sharks, and blue whales. Surprisingly, each of these species is now being found to spend considerable time in nearshore waters. We would think that the oceans being so enormous would buffer the life that lives out there. But in fact, what the tags are revealing is that these animals spend a lot of time close to shore, right in close proximity to our runoff, to where our pollutants enter the water. While we can't yet restore entire oceans, the good news from the census is that there's something we can do. We are locating the particular places where open ocean species approach our shores to feed. That's where we can concentrate our cleanup efforts. That's great. The tag's well positioned, not interfering with the pin. Number two. Tag team, tag team, sunspot. I've got a mola. 2.30 heading from the boat and five miles. Roger. I actually am incredibly optimistic. The attacks are allowing us to listen to the animals. They're telling us what's important to them. They're another window into the impacts that we're having on the oceans, on the planet. Water's path may twist and turn, but the destination is always the same, the ocean. Rivers spill off the shores, creeks flow into rivers, and marshes and ponds feed the creeks. Relying on this liquid network are creatures large and small. By listening to these animals, we can hear messages about our water, our health, and the health of our planet. I think we're finally learning to take our cues from animals. I'm basically an optimistic person, so I believe we can do better, and I think we will do better. I think everything starts with awareness. As a society, maybe we want to invest more in our safety or in, in the safety of the planet. One of the things that I would love is to have people demand better water. A lot of people have not seen what's so obvious to me right there in front of them in that river. To me, it's, it's a holy place, the river and its water and the fish and the birds and everything, to me, it's just the reason I live on this, on this planet.